Several weeks ago, I got an email from One Audio who asked if I would be interested in reviewing a new ANC headphone. One Audio has an offshoot company called Super EQ, and that company has a number of audio products. Today, we take a look at the Super EQ S1 Hybrid ANC headphones. Ooh, that's a mouthful. This product typically costs $100, but is currently on sale for around $60. What has One Audio and its offshoot Super EQ have in store for us? The S1 is a Bluetooth headphone first and foremost. Super EQ says that the product uses Bluetooth 5.0, but I could not find information about the supported codecs. Super EQ does make a number of promises. They claim that this headphone has all day comfort and tout the ANC features. In fact, Super EQ says that the hybrid noise cancellation reduces 33 decibels of ambient noise, but this seems to be for the built in microphone. This headphone supposedly has punchy, thumping bass and rich details. Unfortunately, Super EQ does not have a mobile application for this headphone. Surprisingly, the S1 has very sturdy construction. The photos convey the opposite considering the typical color schemes you may find on flimsy mass-produced throwaway headphones. The S1 has a fair bit of plastic and metal. The ear cups and headband have a dense plastic. The headband substructure is metal. The headphone has very little vertical and horizontal adjustment of the ear cups. The headband is hinged so you can fold the headphones. The ear pads have memory foam padding, however, as far as I can tell, they are not replaceable. The headband padding is less than stellar. There's a rubber coating on top with spongy foam as padding material underneath. It's neither thick nor particularly soft. All controls for the headphones are located on the right side. The volume, playback, and ANC buttons all sit there. The S1 also has a 3.5mm audio jack and a micro USB port for charging. The S1 comes with standard accessories. You get a pleather carrying bag, an audio cable, and a USB charging cable. All of these are acceptable and none are premium. As for comfort, well, that is entirely subjective, but for me, the S1 has a fairly tight clamp. The ear pads slightly pinch the top and bottom of my ears. Passive noise isolation is fairly good and does tend to muffle outside sounds. I can wear the S1 for about one to two hours before needing a break. Overall, the S1 has good construction, but I think the company could have done a better job with the comfort. The headband padding is not soft and I wish they had used memory foam in that area. The clamping force is also kind of a concern, at least for me. I'm sure the tightness of this headphone will suit those who intend to use the S1 for exercising, but casual listening might be a different story. On the other hand, I think the clamping force with the Beats headphones is significantly higher. The S1 needs to be turned on for wired mode. This is a significant limitation. If the headphone's battery is dead, you cannot use it until the battery is sufficiently charged. And I tested this on the Beats Solo 3 which also has the same limitation. To test the S1, I use the RME ADI2 DAC, my Modi Liquid Spark stack, and the Matrix Sabre X and RN HP stack. For the initial sound test, I plug the S1 into these devices with the stock audio cable. I had the noise cancelling off during the initial test. I listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD. The S1 is easy to drive. Any dongle DAC will provide plenty of power. I never had to resort to above 9 o'clock on the Liquid Spark on high gain and about 11 o'clock on low gain, as an example. Super EQ says the S1 has punchy, thumping bass. My tests indicate that this headphone has a bass emphasis. In Mountains by Hans Zimmer, there is a sub bass rumble from the beginning of the song. The S1 easily recreated this detail and added a bit of emphasis. Decay was a little slow, a bit slower than what I heard with the Allo S4X. Separation of sub-bass from mid-bass was essentially missing. When the crescendo hit at the middle of the song, the organ melded heavily with the other instruments. The rolling thunder effect drowned out all the other instruments. When the vocals chimed in, they rose from the background until they were just barely shoulder to shoulder with the instruments. In Conquered by Overwork, there's a rolling marble sound at the beginning. This is supposed to pan from right to left to center. The S1 did present the sound of rolling marbles, but none of the panning. 
There are multiple drums in this track, and the S1 made it very difficult to hear the tonalities of the various individual drums. Drum impacts were hard and overshadowed other elements in the mix. Each drum strike melded with every subsequent drum strike. I listened to several hip-hop songs including Pure Water, Nupitek, Reel It In, and Uproar. On each and every occasion, the S1 presented the sub bass without difficulty. It was like I was standing just a few feet away from the subwoofer. The drums were a little louder than the subwoofer effects. Vocals were about one step behind the drums, but were still fairly clear. I listened to my Sicaria playlist. I used these songs to determine if there is any audible bass distortion. The S1 did not present any such distortion, whether on low or high volumes. Overall, the S1 has a noticeable bass emphasis. Bass clarity is missing, and there is melding between sub-bass and mid-bass. There is some bass bleed into the mids. However, there is no audible distortion in the bass region. Super EQ does not provide information about the mids response. My tests indicate that the S1 has a recessed mids presentation. In Orla Gartland's song Why Am I Like This, there is natural vocal grain and sibilance mixed in. The S1 presented both details. The vocal grain sounded similar as what I heard on the more neutral Allo S4X. The vocal sibilance was not emphasized, and in this regard, the S4X has marginally more sibilance emphasis in comparison. The drums were always louder than the other elements in the mix. There was noticeable melding between the drum, guitar, and vocals. Orlo's voice appeared to be about one step behind these instruments. In Watch It Back by Haim, the S1 again indicated that it does not noticeably emphasize sibilance. At 8 seconds into the track, the primary vocalist says the word we and drags it out, making it sound gravelly. The S1 rendered this detail. There are two backup vocalists, one in either channel. The S1 initially presented both voices separately. However, when the instruments played at maximum, the backup singer's voices melded into one. The drums, guitar, piano, and bass all melded with each other, with the drums sounding louder than the others. The vocals were about one step behind the drums. In Superposition by Young the Giant, the S1 presented the ukulele, drums, and bass without difficulty. However, the drums were louder than the ukulele, and all these instruments melded. The primary male singer's voice was about one step behind these instruments. His sibilance was not emphasized. There's a backup vocalist whose voice is layered beneath the primaries. Most headphones and IEMs cannot separate this subtle detail. And the S1 could not either. Between 1 minute and 10 and 1 minute and 20 seconds, there are sharp intakes of breath. The S1 did present this detail. Overall, the mids are recessed. Vocals are audible, but drums generally are louder. I was surprised to hear a bit more gentle approach to vocals without emphasis of sibilance. Clarity in this region is no better than average. Super EQ says that the S1 has clear treble. My test suggests that this headphone has a gentler treble presentation with a decrease around the mid treble region. In Skirtso for X Wings, the S1 presented the brass and horns. Their nasally signatures were audible but not particularly clear. The higher pitched notes seemed somewhat rolled off. In comparison, the Allo S4X was clearer and had closer to neutral rendition of the treble. The Timfani was noticeably emphasized and its reverberation sometimes overshadowed the other instruments. The S1 presented a stereo sound field. No sounds came from above, below, or out into the wings. In Thrive from the City, the S1 made the piano sound like it was just a few feet away. The bassy notes were emphasized and had slow transients. Each note melded with the next. I could hear some of the electric buzzing and pops and sizzles, though these sounds were generally a little bit muffled. The cello sounded smooth, but melded noticeably with the piano. I could barely hear the creaking of wood on the pianist's bench and the shifting of the cello's weight. In take 5 of the Dave Brubeck Quartet, the S1 presented the piano in the right, drums in the left, saxophone center, and the bass one step behind. The drums were louder than the other instruments. For example, the saxophone sounded like it was about one step behind the drums. The higher pitched notes seemed to be a little rolled off. Compared to the Allo S4X, the S1 was not as clear. The cymbals are struck at different positions, which should result in varying tonalities. The S1 made all cymbal strikes sound the same. Overall, the treble is a little bit rolled off, starting around the mid-treble area. There's noticeable melding among treble instruments. However, no instrument ever sounded harsh or piercing, even at high volumes. The S1 is not a detail-oriented headphone. It does a respectable job, but it is probably no better than average. The bass is fairly emphasized, there's bass bleed into the mids, 
and this results in subtle details becoming shrouded or recessed. Obvious details will be audible, though not always perfectly clear. The creaking of wood, shifting of a cello's weight, multiple vocalists, sharp intakes of breaths, twangs of guitar strings, pops and sizzles, electric buzzing effects, these sounds do appear, but at varying levels of clarity. For a more quantitative test, I use the song New Light by Kazuki. This track has layers of details, including the sound of children playing, wind, rustling of grass, synth, piano, and footsteps. I count the number of steps I can hear in the first 60 seconds. The Sennheiser HD800S presents 22 footsteps. The Focal Clear, 18. The Austrian Hadio Hi-X65 presents 16 to 17. The Hi-X55 presents 16. The Hi-X15 and the X25BT each present 13 to 14 footsteps. The Hi-Fi Mansundara, Avantone Planar, Sifka Phoenix, and the Bayer Dynamic DT1990 present 10 to 11. The Monolith M1070, M1570, Sifka Robin, and Ultrasone Pro 1480i all provide about 8 to 9. The Odyssey LCD2 Closed and the LCD2 Classic each provide 7 to 8. The M1060C provides 7. The Odyssey LCD1 and the HD6XX present 6 to 7 footsteps. The Neumann NDH20 presents 5 to 6. The S1 provided 6 to 7 footsteps. Most of these were muffled. On my scale of detail retrieval, the HD6XX and LCD1 are the average performers. Any headphone that provides more or less detail is judged accordingly. So the NDH20 on my scale would be considered below average and the Hi-Fi Mansundara as above average. The S1 is squarely in the average category, at best. The S1 soundstage is not impressive. Closed bag headphones are usually thought of as incapable of providing wide soundstage. While this is a general precept, it's not a hard and fast rule. For example, the Austrian Audio Hi-X55 has soundstage that is about as wide as that of the Sundara and the Aventone Planar, and the NDH20, despite being closed back, is wider sounding than the other closed back headphones. So it really depends on the particular headphone you're listening to. This is why I have a soundstage scale. Once again, I use the HD6XX and the LCD1 as my average performers. Headphones that have more or less soundstage than these are judged accordingly. The Odyssey Mobius and all Beats headphones have claustrophobic soundstage. The NDH20 and the ATH M60X have below average soundstage. The HD6XX and LCD1 have average soundstage. The Sifka Phoenix, Emotiva GR1, and Ultrasone Pro 1480i have average to maybe above average soundstage depending on the particular recording. The Hi-Fi Mansundara, Aventone Planar, Austrian Audio Hi-X55 and X65 and the LCD2 Classic have above average soundstage. The Hi-Fi Mandiva has wide soundstage. The HD800S has super wide soundstage. In my opinion, the S1 has soundstage that is similar to that of Beats headphones. In other words, quite narrow and claustrophobic. The S1 does not have particularly impressive separation, detail, clarity, or placement. Everything always sounds right next to your ears. Depth and width and verticality are not something you're likely to hear on the S1. Let's not mince words. The S1's overall sound signature is bass heavy. This is neither good nor bad. It simply is. You may or may not enjoy it. The bass region in general has a noticeable emphasis. There's a little bit of separation of sub bass from mid bass, but not a whole lot. The bass bleeds into the mids. The mids are a little bit recessed. Mid centric elements tend to meld with each other. The mids are not particularly clear. On the other hand, Vocals don't get drowned out. They are easily audible, which is a bit surprising considering the bassiness of the S1. There is no harshness in the vocal region. The treble has a slight roll-off somewhere in the mid-treble region. There's not much clarity or separation in this area. However, no treble instrument sounded harsh or piercing. Even at high volumes, the S1 presents a fairly gentle sense of treble. The S1 has average detail retrieval at best, and it has narrow soundstage. Clearly, the S1 is not the perfect headphone for everyone. There is no such product in the market. But if you want a bassy headphone where you'll still be able to enjoy some of the vocals, then the S1 might be your cup of tea. However, if you prefer clarity, detail, and soundstage, then the S1 is not going to make you happy. 
I looked for information about what Bluetooth codecs the S1 supports. I couldn't find that information. So I don't know whether this headphone is compatible with AAC or Aptex. However, Super EQ says that the S1 uses Bluetooth 5.0, so at least you can reap some benefits with longer signal range and strength. Connection via Bluetooth is as simple as with any other device. I had no issues connecting to my iPhone or LG V30. I heard a very slight hiss in the signal when music was not playing. I was sitting in a quiet room and concentrating on hearing something like this and was just barely able to pick it up. However, with audio playing, there's no audible distortion or hiss. Surprisingly, the S1 sound signature did not change perceptibly between wired and wireless modes. Both are bassy. In both circumstances, bass is emphasized, mids are recessed, and treble has a slight roll-off. Detail retrieval and soundstage were also unchanged between wired and wireless modes. I also tried out the ANC. There are three modes, ANC on and off and ambient mode. The first two are self-explanatory. Ambient mode turns on the microphones to let in some of the external sounds. To be honest, the ANC was not close to class leading. In my experience, Sony has the best noise cancellation in the market. Other companies provide good alternatives for lower cost, such as Soundcore's Q30. But I don't think that the S1's ANC is anything to get excited about. Yes, it works. It does eliminate some noise. I didn't feel any pressure on my ears when I used the ANC. And most importantly, I didn't hear any differences in sound signature with the ANC on or off, at least in wireless mode. Oddly enough, when I used noise cancellation in wired mode, there was an obvious difference. When I turned ANC on while in wired mode, the bass was significantly reduced, the mids were further pushed into the background, and trouble had a sharper decline. Ambient mode over a wired connection did not cause such dramatic alterations. In fact, ambient mode sounded the same over wired and wireless. I have no idea why there's such a big difference with sound signature through ANC when the headphone is wired. It's a weird result and one that I have not encountered before. I don't know if my particular headphone is faulty. The S1, as I said earlier on, does not have a companion application. I think it's important we compare products as often as possible. That's the only way to know where products fit in. Here, we will compare the S1 against the Beats Studio 3 and the AKG K361BT. I used the stock accessories for each headphone. I plugged each into a passive AB switch and used the RME ADI2 DAC along with my RNHP Matrix Saber X stack. I listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD. I kept noise cancellation off on the S1. The Beats has just about as much sub-bass emphasis as the S1. However, the Beats appears to have slightly greater separation of sub-bass from mid-bass. Bass transients is slightly faster on the Beats. Mid-bass impact, however, is very similar. There is a bit more bass bleed into the mids on the S1. The mids are quite different. The Beats has clearer vocals, but also greater vocal sibilance and grain. There's a bit more separation and clarity in the mids region on the Beats. Vocals are generally further back on the S1 compared to the Beats. There's more melding among mid-centric elements on the S1. The Beats has a treble emphasis compared to the S1. The S1 has a roll-off roughly in the mid-treble region. The Beats appears to have an emphasis in the upper treble region. The Beats has greater separation of treble instruments and a little bit more clarity. The Beats has slightly wider soundstage than the S1. The Beats has a bit more clarity overall, though detail retrieval is very similar. The K361BT has less bass emphasis than the S1. This is a noticeable difference. The S1 has more sub-bass and mid-bass. The 361BT has more bass clarity and faster transients. Separation between sub-bass and mid-bass is more obvious on the 361BT. Mid-bass impact is harder on the 361BT. Both headphones emphasize bass, but the S1 has a greater overall emphasis. The mids are clearer on the 361BT. The S1 has more bass bleed into the mids, and the mids, particularly vocals, are less obvious on the S1. On the 361BT, vocals are about shoulder to shoulder with the drums. On the S1, the drums are easily one step ahead of vocals. The 361BT has a bit more clarity and separation among mid-centric elements. The 361BT has more sibilance and vocal grain. The treble is a little different between these headphones. The S1 has a treble roll-off starting in the mid-treble region. 
In comparison, the 361BT has an emphasis starting around the mid treble region. The 361BT has more separation and clarity in this area. The S1 tends to sound a bit more muffled than the 361BT. The 361BT has wider soundstage, more clarity, but the same amount of detail retrieval. In my new light test, the 361 rendered the same amount of footsteps, but they were always clearer than what I heard on the S1. Comparisons like these help us understand how far apart products are from each other. Sometimes the differences are significant, and other times they are minor, or as in the case of modern DAX and AMPs, non-existent. All of these headphones could be categorized as bassy. Some might argue that Beats is super bassy, while others might say that the Harman target tuning on the 361BT is bassy. But saying a headphone is bassy isn't remotely helpful without specific examples of what you mean. Here, while all three headphones emphasize bass, they do it to different degrees. They have different variations of clarity, separation, and soundstage. So you must compare and contrast to get a more complete picture of the headphone landscape. All or none of these headphones might be to your liking. Only you will be able to know if these work for your music and meet your preferences. Bluetooth headphones are everywhere. You will never struggle to find a multitude of options on eBay, Amazon, AliExpress, and many other retailers. Pop-up brands and hi-fi manufacturers are all in the game. The question is whether you get more for paying the name brand price. One Audio makes decent stuff. Typically, their headphones aren't the best built or lauded by the hi-fi community, but you cannot deny that One Audio makes affordable gear that might be perfectly agreeable to a lot of people, especially novice audiophiles. The Super EQS One is nothing new in the pantheon of headphones. It does nothing unique or proprietary. There's no wow factor. There's no luxury allure. But the S1 does provide you a specific sound signature, sturdy build, and useful features. The S1 has a significant bass emphasis, recessed mids, and a relaxed treble. You get about average detail and maybe average clarity and fairly narrow soundstage. For some genres, this might be a good combination. I'm sure there are plenty of people who would like a bass emphasized headphone, and the S1 certainly delivers in that respect. The S1's noise cancellation is far from the best, but it works. While you could wish for Sony or Bose level perfection, you can't realistically ask for that type of technology in a sub $100 headphone. And I seriously doubt Sony or Bose would want to license their technologies. The point is that the S1 is a competent headphone that has a particular sound which you may or may not like. This brings us to value. For around $60, I think the S1 does offer value. I cannot imagine that audiophiles will flock to buy this headphone, but neither is it something that should be universally rejected. If you don't want to pay the Apple Beats premium price, and you would like to have some form of ANC for cheap, then the S1 is an option you should consider along with the rest.